let's do it. All right, so everyone, welcome to this week's Marine Money webinar, Riding the Waves of Randy. Um, hope that everyone's having a good weekend wherever they are. Sorry, week. God, time is a thing right now. Um, I'm your host, John Chair, and today we are delighted to have our friend Randy Javiens from Jeffries with us. Many of you know Randy, who is the insightful and inspirationally fit head of, of energy maritime research at Jefferies. Jefferies, of course, being a premier maritime investment bank with decades long sorry, with a decades long dedication to maritime investment banking and research. Our topic today is a very important and timely one, valuation of ships and shipping companies. As all of you know, as risk perception reprices, global equities have been incredibly volatile in the past few months, and shipping is no exception. In addition to factors related to COVID-19 and government's monetary and fiscal response, there are a number of significant conflicting and fundamental factors affecting the prospects for the industry, everything from contango to Chinese demand. And as far as conflicting goes, just today, Cleves issued a sell recommendation on DHT, and yesterday, Stifle and Jefferies issued a buy recommendation on DHT. Very confusing. I mean, interesting. Well, luckily, we have Randy here to shed some light on these times by taking us through current valuations in all the key shipping sectors, and we'll share his valuation methodology and outlook for the future. Now, before I hand over the controls to Randy, a couple of uh, ground rules for those who are new to the webinar. You're all going to be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality of the audio. Um, and during this webinar, you have a control panel that should pop up on your screen. I will pull up an example on mine so that you can see what it should look like. Um, and so there are really two actions that you can take today. The first is to ask a question. I love questions. Randy definitely loves questions. And as a huge baseball fan, he also loves curveballs. So feel free to shoot yeah, shoot me over some of those and I'll pitch it his way. Um, to do this, you simply enter your question in the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them and at, at the end of the webinar, I will ask the questions on your behalf. And the second major action is collapse the menu that's taking up probably half of your screen. Um, and you can do that by clicking on that little arrow at the top of the, of the control panel. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to you, Randy, unless you want me to drive the presentation for you. It's kind of up to you. What do you want? Um, sure, either way, I can put it in mine, or uh, if you want to share it for me, that works too. I'm going to share it with, I'm going to give you hand over the controls to you so that you can drive at your own pace. So should be coming your Good. way now. Excellent. Tell me when you see me here. I think we're good to go. All right. You got the presentation? Yes, sir. Cool. All right. I'm going to turn off my camera. I've been told I have a, a face for radio anyway, so uh, I'll come back on for the Q&A. All right. So, yeah, looking at the shipping equity valuations um, here at Jefferies, we cover 30 different shipping stocks uh, ranging from crude oil tankers, refined products tankers, LNG carriers, LPG carriers, drywall carriers and container ships. So. Uh, we, we use a, uh, an array of valuation methodologies for each subsector. Uh, so we'll get into that. We'll get into some of the market dynamics, uh, and then we'll certainly leave some time for Q&A at the end. So uh, with that, let's start with crude oil tankers. Obviously, that's getting most of the attention nowadays. So when you look at what's going on, crude tanker spot rates are still very high, obviously not as high as they were um, you know, in the last month or so as rates are tightening with the contango trade tightening as front month crude prices are rising um, as OPEC exports are falling with their most recent production cuts uh, and a few other factors here but still very good levels just look at where we were you know for the vast majority of 2019 and if I had this chart for 2018 17 uh, even most of 16 it'd be the same basically the line would be down here so we saw a huge spike in October the China Costco sanctions uh, had a lot of vessels leaving the market for floating storage of VLSFO and prep for IMO 2020. Um, plus, you had a, an array of other factors like the refinery throughput capacity ramping up um, and a few other things. So rates kind of fell off, ramped back up to finish the year, started the year pretty strong. We're talking about 100,000 a day here for VLCC um, and then pulled back, back kind of seasonally with you know some new building deliveries uh, with Chinese New Year. Then obviously with COVID-19 and kind of the destruction thereafter, huge spike 
uh, when Saudi announced that, you know, this is early March when they said, hey, you know what, we are going to increase production, kind of surprising the market. They went on a chartering flurry. In addition, uh, you had a, a steep contango uh, in the forward curve, something we hadn't seen in a few years, right? So with that, you know, the rates soar to 200, 220, 240, 280,000 a day. Uh, we saw a couple of fixtures in the threes, right? Um, with that, you know, we just saw an incredible amount of um, activity. Uh, equities were surging uh, after basically falling, let's call it 30, 40, 50% to start the year, you had a nice surge uh, in, uh, in March and then again in April uh, with the strong rates. Now, what has that done to asset values? Not much, right? You can see here that they've been relatively flat uh, over the last year and even longer. Um, time charter rates have picked up uh, pretty extensively actually for one year VOCC to start the year. We're looking at maybe uh, $48,000, $50,000 a day. Currently, it's closer to 65, 70,000 a day. Uh, the three year VLCC was in the low 30s around the historical average. Now it's closer to, you know, 45, right? So even with the expectation possible for a, a, a pullback with some inventory destocking later this year, you're still getting a much stronger outlook now than you did in January. But the equities are not showing that, right? So, looking specifically at some of the names we cover uh, in our valuation methodologies, uh, you know, DHT Holdings, who reported yesterday, they had their call this morning. Euronavs tomorrow. Frontlines at the end of the month. International Seaways is tomorrow. NAT, who knows? Uh, TNK is in a couple weeks. TNP likely in June. Um, anyway, with that, you know, we have buys on the vast majority of these. Um, we have one hold on uh, Nordic American tankers, and you can see why just in terms of where they're trading on NAV, right? So that is the, the bread and butter valuation for tankers, uh, for dry bulk, and even some of the other asset classes, but predominantly tankers and dry bulk where there's an ample amount of liquidity in the secondhand asset market, right? In the sale and purchase of three-year-old, five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old now um, asset values. So you have a good um, good picture for what, your net asset values are worth. Now we use some broker reports, we use vessels value. So we use a, a, a few different um, um, inputs for our vessels value. Um, and then we get the market value of the ships, add in the cash, subtract out the debt, liabilities, even dividend announcements, and you get to your net asset value. So looking at our methodologies, you know we're giving most of them premiums, uh, especially those who are paying nice dividends, right? DHT. Uh, 60%, frontline 60%, Euronav an 80% of net income. So we're only giving them around a 10% uh, bump to our baseline NAV. Part of that's due to what we think will be a premium for the dividends. Part of that's due to um, to account for rising NAVs, uh, especially with all this free cash that's going to be coming. Um, and part of that's due to our kind of underlying view on asset values, right? So. Anyway, so a slight premium to NAVs uh, for those with dividends. Uh, NAT, you know, with their retail following, uh, with the kind of what could be even bigger dividends, right? Who knows? We give them a, a higher um, premium to NAV, still a hold rating, right? Because now, now they're trading at, I don't know, 180, 200% of NAV, um, whereas the others are all below NAV, which we'll see in a second. So that's kind of our methodology um, for the tankers. Now, Looking at historically, right, this is a, a, a very important chart for where crew tankers have traded uh, historically to NAV. Now, again, if we take this back 10 years, right, we have basically 10 years worth of data. So throwing out the kind of super cycle in 2004 to eight, but for 10 years, the average crew tanker has traded around 95 to 100% of NAV with big swings, right? Sometimes they're 140, 150% of NAV, Sometimes they're down to 50% of NAV, right? And this is kind of the average line, the black line here. So you can see over the last year, they've been pretty much uh, in line with, uh, with NAV. They started the year strong with IMO outlook and, and kind of some um, potential for, for strong rates in 2020, um, but have since fallen. And again, this is a lot of just forced selling, a lot of short selling, um, a lot of just people who are scared of COVID-19 and no one wanted to touch economically sensitive, China exposed, 
you know, tankers, right? So you had a sharp sell-off. They've since rebounded, um, and now you're, you're kind of seeing um, them closer to NAV, although there's a few outliers, right? NAT way up here, all the others below. So we're still pretty bullish on the market. And uh, in terms of bull bear, as, as Jonathan alluded to, you know, you, you certainly have two sides of the coin. Um, you know, we remain bullish just because of the valuations well below NAV. You're in record level rates uh, for 2Q. You already had, like I said, DHT report 1Q records uh, relative to a very strong 4Q19. And now 2Q is certainly going to be a record, right? Same is going to be true for EuroNAV and INSW and, and a lot of the peers. So we are very bullish, uh, especially in the next few months. Now, what happens in a destocking period? What happens later this year? What happens in 2021? Um, who knows, right? I think there will be some rate softness. But again, rates don't have to be $80,000 a day for these tankers to make money. And that's a lot of our uh, kind of sights on that. So even though we th think there will be rate softness six months from now, 12 months from now, we still think the equities um, are very undervalued and people are scared that rates are going to 10,000 a day, right? Which they did in 2018 during the destocking period. But there's a few differences. One, the order book is much smaller. So the supply side is so much more attractive now than it was three or four years ago during the last big inventory stocking cycle. Secondly, floating storage is at records, right? And a lot of those vessels are going to be offline for six to 12 months as they store that crude. So we don't expect them to come back to the active market anytime soon. Um, so for those reasons, we're pretty bullish on, on equities um, and even rates here for the next few weeks and months. Now, people who are saying, well, 2022 might be weak. If you're looking at 2022, you should not be investing in tankers, right? No one has any insight for two years from now, three years from now. So this is not the sector to be discounting 2022, 2023 cash flows. So looking at the next 12 months, maybe even 18 months, you take an average rate for that period, it's gonna be very strong. So looking at refined products tankers, you know, these are Ardmore, Diamond S, Scorpio tankers, who also reported this morning. You've seen this massive surge in rates as well. Now, it usually lags crude tankers, the refined products do, uh, for a few reasons. One, when crude tankers move, you start to see some switching, which we have, of the older, larger refined products tankers into trading crude. Um, and then secondly, as we've seen more recently, you've seen a lot of cascading down into you know, smaller ships for floating storage and for some long haul trades. Like an MR usually doesn't go you know, um, Mideast to Asia, but they have been recently just because LRs are so strong. Um, and you're also seeing refined products being stored, D jet fuel, uh, diesel, gasoline for anywhere from three, six, even nine months. So with that, you've seen a very strong run in charter rates, uh, spot rates especially, to all-time high levels, right? We have never seen LR2s at 150,000 a day. Um, Scorpio said they booked one recently at 170, right? LRs around 100, MRs above 50. It's it's just it's just ridiculous. Um, asset values have gone up some, obviously nowhere near uh, the spot rates because time charter rates are somewhere between these, right? Spot rates move first, they have the most volatility, then time charter rates one year, three year, then asset values. But again, no one knows what the market looks like in you know 18 months, two years, and beyond. So there's not really a, a big rush to you know, expand your fleet and then buy a bunch of second hands here. Uh, in terms of valuation methodology, pretty similar to what we do with crude, basically on NAV, right? And, and people underestimate or kind of poo-poo NAV valuations because, oh, it's a moving target and all these other things. Well, if you look at kind of historical um, equity offerings, they've been done at premiums to NAV. And when you have historical share repurchases, which we've seen on a lot of the tankers and even dry bulk over the past year or so, they've all been done at big discounts to NAV. So NAV is a very important metric um, and it accounts for time charter rates. It accounts for expectations in, in moves and asset values, right? So anyway, so we, we use a uh, methodology here of NAV, you know, some are right at NAV, DSSI maybe gets a, a, a slight discount for their kind of trading um, liquidity or, or lack thereof, right? And their smaller market cap, focusing on debt repayment. 
But if you gave them a, a nav basis, it's trading closer to the price target would be closer to 19 or 20 bucks, right? So even with a discount to nav, still $18 price target compared to, you know, whatever it is today, 12 or 13. Um, so again, looking at the similar chart for product tankers in terms of price to nav, you see a, you know, around 80 to 100%. Now these, this is pulled down some um, by DSSI recently here. Um, and even Ardmore and Sting had some weaker periods. But again, being at this trough level, 60, 65, 70% of NAV, while rates are at record highs, seems like a dislocation. Thus, the buy ratings on those. So I'll briefly run through some other sectors to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, here's our comp table, which, you know, we also look at EV EBITDA. We look at price to earnings, although, you know, it's hard to look at price to earnings historically because you've had negative earnings a lot of times, right? But looking at 2020, 2021, um, looking at EV EBITDA ratios, we're talking the lowest ever. So very attractive time for tankers. Uh, on the LNG side, you know, market's a lot, lot weaker. You don't really have the floating storage play because of the boil off. You already have very weak demand um, just from a very mild winter, plus bloated inventories, both in Europe and Asia. Plus now with COVID-19 and economy shutting down, you know, there's just less need for it. So all that being said, rates have come off uh, pretty meaningfully here uh, on the LNG spot rates, even on the kind of TFDE rates, they're in the, the 30s, you know, right now. Asset values haven't really moved, but again, there's not a huge um, market for secondhand LNG carriers, especially relative to tankers or dry bulk. So looking at the six under coverage, you know, we're pretty evenly split. We have three holds, we have three buys. Um, you know, we certainly like a uh, goal are here. We look at that on the sum of the parts, um, looking at their LNG carriers. Then you're looking at uh, the Hilly. You're looking at the Tor2 project that's likely here with BP in the next few years. Uh, you're looking at Golar Power, which just started ramping up. So we really like Golar, as you can tell, uh, with our price target versus the current market price. Um, seems like an outside risk reward balance here. Um, in terms of gas log, you know, they are pure play LNG shipping company now, but at these levels, the yield is pretty substantial. Uh, you know, if you're paying a 15 cent quarterly dividend, you're getting 60 cents a share. The market price is four bucks, right? So it's, it's a, a pretty attractive valuation there in terms of a 15% yield uh, with massive coverage ratio. Um, Switching, all right, here you go for the LNG uh, price to NAV. Again, NAV's not as attractive. You had gas hog partners trading at huge premiums because of the massive distributions. They cut those distributions, hence the price fell pretty dramatically. Um, but here's the LNG carrier's price to NAV. Same thing, you know, on these, we look much more at dividend yields. Um, we look much closer at, you know, EV EBITDA ratios. So, for the valuations on LNG carriers, it is NAV, it is some of the parts, but it's also yield-based, it's also EV EBITDA-based. Switching over to LPG carriers, um, you know, we cover two, we cover Navigator Holdings, um, and then we cover Stealth Gas. So Navigators in your, your medium-sized, handy-sized um, propane, ethane, now ethylene vessels, 20 to 25,000 cubic meters. Um, and then the stealth gas is your smaller ones. That's the last mile, the five, seven, 10,000 cubic meter vessels uh, that are just doing the kind of ship to ship transfers and bringing the propane to the end user. So for both of these, we, we use NAV or kind of a sum of the parts a little bit for Navigator. Now with their ethylene export terminal already ramping with enterprise products partners. Um, and then for stealth gas, you know, it's it's just silly. Uh, the the methodology, the valuation, the nav is probably closer to seven, eight bucks. It's trading at two fifty. So even using a fifty percent of nav, you're getting a four dollar price target, and that's why Stealth Gas just did a very large tender offer for their shares. Right? They see the disconnect as well. They have ample cash on the balance sheet, so they're buying back shares as much as they can. Um, they just completed one likely to do another, likely to continue the ongoing share repurchases. So we like both of these names, uh, especially from a valuation um, standpoint. Um, same thing, here's our comp table, looking at EV EBITDA. Um, you can look at, you know, kind of PE for next year for some of these, uh, NAV per share, here's some of the debt metrics, all these other things. 
switching over to dry bulk, you know, that market has certainly been weak. We've seen a, a huge drop off in rates uh, from the start of the year to where we are today. Most of this is driven by China, right? Most of this is driven by Brazilian Chinese, uh, Brazilian iron ore exports. So with that, you know, you've had valuations coming in very sharply. Um, and I'll switch over to that and come back to where we just were. You know, you've seen kind of price to navs. They've never really gotten above 80% uh, the last year or so. Um, they had a nice climb in June, July, August last year after the Brucuta mine dam failure in the beginning of the year. And then you had some rebounding cargoes on Cape sizes ramping back up. Um, so we expect probably a similar move this year, right? Because the valuations are so cheap. We're talking 40, 50, 60% of NAV. And again, let's say the asset values go down 10%. So your net asset values go down 15 to 20%. Still huge disconnects uh, between even a kind of pro forma NAV. Uh, let's just say it's really 80%, right? Uh, pro forma NAV and where they're trading today. So substantial upside uh, for if and when you get these Brazilian cargoes coming back, you get Cape size rates rallying, you should see a nice move in the equities. For these, we are discounting our NAVs, right? In terms of our methodology, we're not using NAVs. We think, yeah, NAVs have some downward pressure as asset values come off, as you're burning cash. This is completely opposite of tankers. Free cash flow helps NAV. Burning cash hurts your NAV, right? So giving a... 80% uh, methodology for NAV, you're still getting price targets well above kind of current uh, valuations, hence mostly buy ratings, right, with one hold out there. Um, you know, moving on, uh, here's our whole uh, comp table showing EV EBITDA multiples, um, showing some, some PEs, showing our NAVs, price to NAVs uh, right in this area. Uh, and you can get all these tables in our weekly, um, which we publish every, you know, Sunday night, Monday morning. So if you, if you are, are missing some of this or you want some of this data, um, obviously you can get that uh, with subscribing to our research here. Uh, container ships, just to finish up briefly, you know, you've had a, a kind of steady decrease um, in rates, uh, especially for the kind of smaller tonnage. The big tonnage, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 TEU, relatively stable, not a huge market there uh, for rechartering because a lot of those are on long-term charters and they're only a couple years old. Same thing with the asset values, haven't really moved much. Now, obviously with COVID-19, with the slowing uh, kind of factory output from China, followed by slowing demand from the US, from uh, Europe, as these economies are in kind of lockdown, you're, you're seeing some slowing rates. You're seeing container ship values start, starting to soften a little bit here. Um, so that's our expectation. The liners are certainly in a little worse shape currently um, than they were, you know, two or three months ago. And so go the liners, so go the container owners, right? Because they charter their tonnage to Hapeg Lloyd, Maersk, CMA CGM, uh, HMM, you know, the list goes on. So the stronger the balance sheets um, and the, the cash flow for the liner companies, the better off the container owners are as well. But for both of these, Capital Product Partners, uh, they had their call this morning. They reiterated their distribution, 35 cents a quarter. So you're getting a dollar 40 for an annual uh, yield that equates to about 16% at current valuations, right? This is a little stale. It's down today. It's closer to you know 850, something like this. So 16% yield with coverage ratios of 2x pretty attractive. Same with the Naus, you know, for them, they have yet to institute their kind of dividend, but we expect that coming soon. Uh, so for them, we're just using kind of a, an NAV basis. It's at least 10 bucks, you know, maybe it's 12, who knows, but even using 10, obviously, again, a pretty large disconnect. So here's kind of that same uh, comp table that we have for the others uh, in terms of looking at EV, but da, um, looking at your NAVs, looking at your yields. And just looking at Denaus, right? It is trading at less than one times earnings. It made, um, you know, nine bucks last year, six bucks this year, likely making another six dollars next year, trading at four dollars, right? Less than that. Um, so again, pretty large disconnect here. Obviously, the, the market cap is pretty small, seventy-one million dollars. Uh, still waiting on that dividend uh, over here, but again, Denaus, uh, pretty large disconnect.
So with that, you know, happy to open it up to some Q and A if there are any. Um, I'll turn the video back on uh, so you know I'm still here, and I'll pass it back to John. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, that was action packed. There was a lot of you crammed in there, and I'm and I apologize to the audience. We're at already, already at 1:33, but we're going to stick around and do a bit of Q and A. Um, but feel free to drop off. I know there's quite a few people still on the line, but um. And Randy, we've got quite a variety of questions, so I'm going to probably start you off with some some easy ones. Um, but if you could keep your answers relatively short, so we can kind of get through them, that'd be great. The um, sure. the first one is like, would appreciate your views on the offshore industry, particularly jack up rigs. Um, yeah, you know, we don't really cover many of those. You know, ship finance has a couple, um, but they're mostly chartered. Um, back to Sea Drill, who then charters them out to uh, Conoco Phillips and Stat Oil and others. Um, but again, in this very low Brent crude price environment, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of production cuts. Most of that is onshore. Um, most of the drilling rigs have pretty low lifting costs. So, you know, obviously it's it's pressured, um, but we think offshore, uh, the drilling rigs that are on long term charters, we think those continue just because of the <clears throat> pretty attractive economics. Great. Um, another question that came in was that you seem to be using many different methodologies. How and why do you choose one over the other? Um, yeah, you know, uh, again, for a sector with a lot of S&P activity, we're talking dry bulk, we're talking refined products, we're talking crew tankers. Um, it's, it's pretty common to use NAV. You know, we're very comfortable with our NAV valuations because the market values um, are pretty easy to, to back into. Um, when you look at some of the others, LNG, LPG, container ships, you know, with long-term charters, <clears throat> with a lack of uh, S&P activity, EV EBITDA metrics or, or yield-based are much more uh, probably appropriate, right? So again, we use all three. Uh, we look at yield, we look at EV EBITDA, we look at NAV for all the companies um, and kind of sense check uh, our analyses. Sometimes we average the three, uh, right, to kind of get of our, our fair value or our price targets. Um, but right, we do kind of tend to, or tend to use NAVs for those with more liquid S&P activity uh, and EV EBITDA or yield based for the others. Great. Um, the, this is kind of a, almost a two part question, but like, what is the source of your freight price data? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the day rates, I'm assuming, um, we're looking at uh, multiple broker reports. You know, we get uh, Fernleys and Clarksons and Hal Robinsons, um, plus a few others. Um, so that's where we're looking in terms of mostly broker reports that we kind of populate and average. Got it. And the second part to that is, you know, what is your sharp ratio for previous forecast um, predictions? Or how do you quantitatively measure your previous buy-sell signals? Yep. Um, so we look at our kind of, uh, in terms of the, we do both, right? Let me answer on the rate, um, how often or how correct are we? You know, we are measured on our earnings estimate accuracy. And the big thing that drives earnings are our rate assumptions, right? That's the real only variable. Interest expense, depreciation, all the, all the expenses are, are pretty standard. Um, so the revenue line is the one that bounces all over the place. So where you look at kind of historical R, rate assumptions based um, uh, historically kind of saying, all right, how did they pan out? How close were we? How close <clears throat> was the forward curve to it? How close were time charter rates to it? Um, so we kind of mark ourselves basically every quarter to that, um, especially on the EPS accuracy. And then on the buy, sell, hold stock recommendations, right, we also get graded on that both internally um, in terms of our Jeffrey scorecard, um, as well as externally, you know, uh, Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg, um, the few other um, kind of measuring sticks uh, give out basically rankings for how your estimates or how your recommendations did relative to what actually happened. So if you have a buy rating and the stocks goes up, you know, you get credit for that. If you have a buy rating and the stock goes down, uh, you get negative points for that, right? Hold ratings are usually um, neither. And then sell ratings, obviously the inverse of the buy ratings. All right. Um... I think that we're going to pop over to another question. So this one, bear with me. So assuming significantly lower U.S. gas production in the coming years and delayed export facilities, do you have a possible floor level for LNG rates and specifically re GLNG? How would this change your price target? Um, yeah, good question. Um, we are certainly relatively bearish on LNG rates, right? I think our second quarter average is 
thirty thousand a day. Um, third quarter is not much better. Right now, you've just seen a lot of production shut-ins already. Uh, you have some U.S. Um, producers, Chenier and others, shutting in production. They're actually offering or kind of trying to buy tenders from other producers to satisfy their contracts, right? Because it's cheaper to go buy LNG at record low prices. We're talking a dollar eighty in Asia. We're talking a dollar fifty in Europe, right? Much cheaper to just go buy the LNG. Um, then buy the net gas domestically, liquefy it, all these other things. So um, because of that, you're certainly going to see less LNG production uh, here in the next few months. And that obviously hurts your LNG shipping needs, um, right? So in terms of where we are for, for Golar, you know, we already bake in pretty weak LNG shipping environment uh, for at least the next year uh, into our model, into our price targets, into our sum of the parts, you know, valuation. Um, you know, they were looking at spinning off their LNG carriers uh, that kind of failed in December. Um, they guided to maybe the summer, but more recently, they've kind of pulled away from that just because of the current environment. Um, so who knows? But again, for Golar, that is a smaller part of earnings and evaluation going forward, right? As <clears throat> Hilly's already ramped up, um, as you might get, you know, additional capacity from Hilly, um, as Golar Power ramps up you have some massive upside there because of the low lng prices you know so that's why for golar low lng prices are good golar power now makes more money right um and then you'll have tour two in a few years so for golar specifically not as impactful uh, in terms of the lng shipping rates as it is to a um you know a gas log or someone with a little more spot exposure all right thank you and then we have another one here that talks about you know tanker rates are up Results have been strong for Q1 with excellent Q2 guidance, but crude and product tankers share prices are capitulating. Any views yep. as to why there is this disconnect? Yeah, it is crazy. I've been covering tankers uh, and shipping here at Jefferies since 2011, uh, so nine years. And this is one of the most disconnected markets I've seen, uh, right? You, you have these Scorpio, you had DHT, um, even Ardmore yesterday with decent results, um, all guiding. To like record second quarters, uh, DHT with a big dividend announcement this morning, um, and then another, you know, coming on the after the second quarter results. Euronav's coming out tomorrow. Um, probably won't be very different than DHT. Same with International Seaways. But again, you've had a lot of fast money getting into these names uh, in the last six weeks that have said, oh, I'll just I'll just hold till earnings, and now they're selling, right? So, just looking at last week, you had record trading the liquidity. For a lot of these tankers, it was like in the hundreds of millions of dollars a day, uh, just numbers we've never seen, right? So you you can kind of tell, okay, with that kind of trading liquidity, um, most of the people buying and selling these shares are not long-term holders, all right? So they're kind of trying to play a quarter, um, whatnot. So today, you know, the equities opened four or five percent higher. They were there for about ten or fifteen minutes, um, and then it was just, oh, what just happened? Uh, you know, I, I turned around, hung out with my daughter for like five minutes, came back to the screen and share prices were down 10%. Okay, um, so it, it just doesn't really make much sense to us. Um, you know, again, for DHT, for that dividend they announced, you have to be a shareholder, uh, I think it's on May 16th, right? So we're still two weeks away. So selling today, you're not getting that dividend that was announced. So there's been a lot of kind of capitulation in that, um, some, some concerns around rates going to 10,000 a day, just because the chart, 200, 160, 120, 80, 60, oh no, it's going to 10. Not gonna happen. But again, if you're a short-term trader and you're looking at that chart, it's hard to have conviction for the next couple months. Great. Now we're gonna kind of turn to a, kind of some ESG questions. So if, do you think ESG is having any effect on the investment appetite for shipping? Um, you know, ESG was a huge kind of topic of conversation, maybe late 2019, even early 2020. Haven't heard those three letters in two months, right? With the whole um, kind of COVID-19 and everything else, ESG is kind of on the back burner. But again, yes, you know, for ESG, um, no matter if you are a battery powered or wind powered, right, VLCC, um, you're still moving crude oil. And in some parts of the world, Crude oil is, you know, a, a dirty word and it's a dirty product, right? Um, no pun intended there. But um, so, yeah, I think for, for ESG side, some people just can't invest in energy, can't invest in shipping, right? And that's understandable. Sure. I think others on the ESG scorecard, a lot of it's about transparency, 
So as long as you are putting out your carbon emissions and all these other metrics for environmental, for um, your kind of social and, and, you know, your board diversification and these other things, your governance and kind of third party transactions and what have you, um, as long as you can, you know, uh, be transparent with that, I think a lot of it is just qualifying ESG because it's impossible to quantify ESG, even if you are a, a kind of green shipping company environmentally, how do you compare that if your board's all male or if your corporate governance isn't great, um, you know, or vice versa, right? You might have stellar corporate governance. You might have an incredibly diverse board and be very socially responsible, but environmentally, you're not too great, right? So how do you weight the three different letters, E, S, G? Um, so with that, you know, I, I think it's gotten some headlines, uh, especially in Europe, um, but here in the US, again, not many clients are talking about it currently. Great, and so we're gonna end with one kind of, kind of broader picture question. Randy, if you had a million dollars to invest, what would you buy? Um, I, I won't give a Robert Bugby answer, like uh, a house on the beach, right? Um, so I'll talk about shipping equities, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, Obviously, like Golar, massive dislocation, six bucks versus our price target of 18. Um, I'll continue to ride the tanker rally, right? Uh, I think those share prices will recover. Uh, you know, obviously, there's some short term capitulation, um, but I think that that recovers here, um, especially, you know, once you start getting these dividends, start getting paid, when you see a little bit more of rate stability. So for those, we like DHT, we like Euronav, we like Frontline with the big dividends, we like INSW, who's reporting tomorrow. So I would say a basket of equities, you know, I don't like the question, give me one name, you know, and I get that sometimes, um, that I have to invest in. So I'd say a, a basket approach. And again, there's a couple of dry bulk equities that I like here as well. Starbulk, Genco, um, Eagle Bulk, a few others that just the valuations, yeah, the market stinks, but the valuations pricing in a terrible market for three years when we think it's gonna be a terrible market for three weeks or maybe three months, right? Um, so again, you know, in line with our price targets and our, our buy ratings, um, Golar, um, some of the big crew tankers, uh, Scorpio tankers at 20 bucks is just silly, right? We think it's at least 30, probably 32, 35. Um, and then some of the dry bulk names, if you have some stomach for volatility in the next few weeks, uh, we think shareholders will be rewarded um, in the next few months. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think that's all about that. You know, we have time for. So uh, thanks again, Randy, for a stunning presentation. Always a joy to have you on the Marine Money stage. Uh, for everybody sure. listening, this webinar will be posted to our site later today or tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. And we'll also send a follow up email tomorrow um, with some new contact details. So if you if your question wasn't answered today, we'll help her be able to follow up with Randy tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so that's, thank you for joining. Um, and you know, for now, this is John Chair from Marine Money signing out. Stay happy and good fortune, everyone.